Hello everyone, this is Hwain Aryan. Uh, thank you all for joining. It's a great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Wei Chao To from University of West Virginia. Uh, Dr. To received her PhD in 2011 from the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, she then spent three years at Los Alamos National Laboratory as a postdoc fellow. In 2015, she joined the West Virginia University as an assistant professor. Uh, and now she has recently been promoted to an associate professor, uh, which has been extensively involved in the quantitative analysis and numerical modeling of energetic particles in the Earth's inner magnetic sphere. For example, she's modeling the trapped radiation environment in, Earth, in near Earth space. And she has developed various physics-based models to simulate the dynamics of relativistic electrons in the Earth's radiation belts. Wei Chao has received several awards and fellowships, including prestigious NSF Career Award and Cultural Scholar Award. Uh, today, Wei Chao will talk about the participation of energetic particles from the inner magnetic sphere. Um, as we know, this presentation will be recorded, uh, so please keep your microphones muted. If you have questions, you can text uh, or uh, text them in the chat, private chat to me, or post them in the group chat, and I will try to ask them at the end of the presentation. Uh, Dr. Wei Chao please take the slides when you're right. Yeah, it's already there. Can you see it? Uh, yes, we can see your slide. All right, thank you. Thank you, Homeyan, for the nice introduction. And thank you, everyone, for listening in today. I know many of you had a big virtual jam meeting last week, so we cannot get enough, right? So um, uh, again, I'm Wei Chao Tu from West Virginia University. Very honored to have this opportunity to present in this online seminar uh, series. Um, when I was first invited to talk about precipitation, my first reaction was, wow, this is a big topic. So, well, but still thank you, Kyle and Clay for the kind invitation. So then I sneakily changed the title to precipitation of energetic particles from the inner magnetosphere to make my life easier. So do not be mad if I miss your favorite type of precipitation. Now uh, let's get started. Um, this is the outline of my talk. I will first uh, introduce some background about precipitation. What is precipitation? Why do we care about it? And what drives precipitation? Then I will review the recent advances in quantitatively characterizing precipitation in both the observational and modeling perspectives. And then finished with some discussion on the remaining unsolved questions and future opportunities. So what is the precipitation we are talking about? Is this this type of precipitation? Well, unfortunately, no, for those of you listening in during the launch time. So the precipitation we are talking about is the precipitation of charged particles from the Earth's uh, magnetosphere into the atmosphere. So uh, this all starts from the basic, uh, basic motions of charged particles in Earth's magnetosphere including the gyration around the uh, local magnetic field line, the bounce motion between two mirror points, and the drift motion around the Earth. So for the bounce motion, the altitude of the mirror point is decided by the angle between the local magnetic field and the velocity vector, this alpha angle, which is called the pitch angle. When the pitch angle is large, the mirror point of the particle is at, is at high altitude, so the particle is trapped. But if the pitch angle gets very small like this, the particle mirror point will be lower altitude and it will reach the Earth's atmosphere, then the particle will be lost to the atmosphere, which is called precipitation. And based on this, we define a concept called loss cone. So basically, particles with, with pitch angle inside the loss cone will be precipitated into the atmosphere. So that is the precipitation we're talking about. Then why do we care about precipitation? The top reason I care about precipitation because my research focus is 
precipitation means the loss of particles, right? So precipitation is one of the main loss mechanism of radiation belt electrons and ring current particles. Um, so here in this talk, when I was talking, wh whenever I'm talking about precipitation type, I try to specify the energy range for the precipitated particles. Uh, I think this very be, will be very useful for the, especially the student audience, because the term energetic can mean very different energies in different communities or different regions. So I try to be specific about the energy range. So for the ring current particle, the precipitation we're talking about is tens to hundreds keV uh, electrons and protons. And then for radiation belt, we're talking about electrons in the 100 keV to multiple MeV and protons in tens to hundreds MeV. So this is an example of the rapid electron dropout observed in the radiation belt uh, by Van and Probe's mission. The color is the one MeV electron flux observed by Van Allen probes, distributed versus time and L. So you can see the flux show a fast dropout. Oh, uh, the drop can be orders of magnitude on a very short time scale, can be less than hours. So where do the electrons go during the rapid dropout? That is one of the most important outstanding questions in radiation belt studies. Well, we know particles, well, where do they go, right? We know the particle can either be lost into the atmosphere by precipitation or lost to the outer boundary, the magnetopause, by outward radio diffusion. But the relative contribution of these two mechanisms and also the detailed drivers of the loss are still not fully understood. So that is the first reason why we care about precipitation. The second reason, or maybe the top reason for many people to care about precipitation is it can produce spectacular aurora, right? Uh, aurora is produced by precipitation of 0.1 to 10 keV charged particles. And this picture, beautiful aurora picture, is taken during the uh, June 2015 storm, that is a powerful uh, CME storm, and the picture is taken at, uh, in Canada, Ontario, Canada, which is at a relatively high um, latitude where the aurora is mostly often observed. But because this June 2015 event is so powerful, we actually had the chance to see the aurora at low latitude, including West Virginia. And this is the picture taken from West Virginia for the aurora during the same event. Also very beautiful. Uh, this occurs right before I moved to West Virginia. Otherwise, I may have the chance to see this in person. So in this talk, I wouldn't uh, talk too much about Aurora because I know we have several talks scheduled after this one focusing on Aurora. So I'm very looking forward to those talks. Now, this is the second reason why we care. And third, why we care about precipitation is the precipitation of the aurora energy range particles is an important component of MI coupling, magnetosphere ion sphere coupling. This diagram is in courtesy of Yi Ching Yu from her talk, which shows the coupling process. We see here the particle precipitation is an important input to ion sphere conductance. The chain conductance directly affect the ion sphere convection electric field. Then the electric field is very important. It controls the transport of particles in the magnetosphere. The particle transport will in turn affect the wave excitation and also particle scattering in the magnetosphere. And that would in turn feed back to participation. So this is how the coupling works. And this shows understanding the precipitation and the quantifying the precipitation is very important for MI coupling. So that's the third motivation. And the last one I want to mention here is the precipitation of aurora energy and up to even relativistic energy particles, my favorite particles, has a strong impact on atmospheric chemistry. Okay, uh, this is a diagram modified from the Sepperlab paper, 2014 paper, showing how this works. So energetic particle precipitation, EPP, when they hit the atmosphere, it will produce 
uh, nitrogen oxides, NOx, and hydrogen oxides, HOx. Um, actually, the penetration depth of the EPP <coughs> depends on the energy of the particle. The higher the energy, the deeper it penetrates. For the high energy particle, which is shown here, it can penetrate directly into the stratosphere. But for lower energy particles, it may be only able to penetrate into thermosphere or mesosphere, generating NOx there. But the NOx can further transport into the stratosphere. Why do we care about NOx in the stratosphere? This is because NOx, as shown here, can recombine with the O3 in stratosphere, which acts as a powerful destroyer for ozone. So precipitation, energetic particle precipitation, is very important for the atmospheric chemistry and also our human lives, right? So thus, we know what is precipitation, why do we care about precipitation? Now let's continue to talk about what drives precipitation. There are two main processes which can drive precipitation. The first is pitch angle scattering, the other is enlarged loss cone. What is pitch angle scattering? Basically, the particle pitch angle scatter, change, and it can change, getting smaller and smaller, and eventually be inside the loss cone, the particle will be uh, precipitated. So because the pitch angle is changed during the pitch angle scattering, you will violate either the first or the second adiabatic environment. Pitch angle scattering can be caused by particles interacting with various waves in the magnetosphere, or it can be caused by anomalous magnetic field geometries. Um, changing particle pitch angle is one way to get it into the loss cone, to get it precipitated. The other way to get the particle precipitated is to enlarge the loss cone, make the loss cone bigger. So that's the second process. And that is related to the inward radio transport driven by the ultra low frequency waves. So for each of this mechanism, don't worry if you don't get the details because I'm going to spend the, the, the following few slides to explain this mechanism in a little more detail. So here we go. The first one is pitch angle scattering by magnetosonic waves. What happens is the particles will be in gyro resonant resonance with the waves, as shown in this equation. Left hand side is the Doppler shifted wave frequency, and that's, that matches the multiples of the gyro resonance, the gyro frequency of particles. So, and the gamma is the relativistic, relativistic factor. That's the gyro resonance condition. When this is satisfied, it will violate the first environment of particles leading to a pitch angle diffusion. This diagram shows the population of waves that can efficiently pitch angle scatter particles. And this is in courtesy of Wen Li from her 2019 jam tutorial talk. And I will just give a brief overview here. The first wave candidate is chorus, whistler mode chorus. And showing this uh, purple-ish bulge around the Earth, you can see chorus is generally located outside plasma pores and the MLT range from midnight up to dawn and even to noon, a little bit afternoon, a wide region. Chorus can scatter electrons in the energy range of ones to tens keV. The second wave candidate is the ECH wave shown here or the electrostatic electron cyclotron harmonic wave. That wave is actually located in similar region as chorus, outside plasma pause, midnight, pre-midnight to about dawn. But ECH waves scatter low energy electrons, 10, 100 keV to a few keV. So that's ECH wave, plasma ferric heat, this yellow region here, is also efficient in scattering uh, particles into the loss cone. Plasma spheric heat is generated inside plasma sphere or in the prune region. It's usually stronger on the day side and it can scatter uh, electrons in the range of tens to hundreds keV. And also we have EMIC waves, this dark uh, region here uh, in, the, in the dusk region. EMIC wave is generally located in the overlapped region of ring current and plasma sphere due to its generation mechanism. EMIC wave can scatter 
tends to 100 keV protons as well as greater than MeV electrons. So also we have another pool of nonlinear waves and I just mentioned one example here which is the TDS, time domain structures. And that's the green region, green bulge here. TDS located from dusk to dawn and can scatter less than 10 keV electrons. So this is just a list of the waves and this is not an exclusive list. And you also see I didn't include any reference here due to the lack of space. So if you're interested in this, please refer to Wendy's slides, which is available on the JAM Wiki website. Um, well, she did a very comprehensive review of the wave particle direction in the magnetosphere. So that's the pitch angle scattering by waves. And pitch angle scattering can also happen in the absence of waves due to the anomalous geometry of the magnetic field. And the first type is called field line curvature scattering. This occurs when the magnetic field line are highly stretched so that the dryer radius of the particle is comparable to the radius of curvature of the field line. So because of this mechanism, the scale of the curvature, this violates the first at the environment, leading to pitch angle scattering. So FLC scattering is most effective on the night side. Why? Because the field line most is stretched there, right? And it's also more efficient on the equator because at the equator, the field is weaker, but the dryer radius is larger. So make this effect more uh, significant. And also we know the dryer radius of particle gets bigger when the particle energy increases and when the particle goes to larger distance from Earth. So we also know FLC is more significant for higher energy particles at larger L. Uh, many previous studies have looked at FLC and they found FLC scattering can lead to pitch angle scattering of particles in different regions, in many different regions of the Earth's magnetosphere. That include the keV electrons and protons in the plasma sheet in the tail region, and also hundreds keV ions in the ring current region. Here I show some uh, results from my group, and this work is led by my postdoc, Wondi Ishito. Well, he did some detailed test particle simulation of FLC to calculate the ion lifetimes due to FLC scattering. And this is the results he got. The color is the lifetime in hours. Well, you can see the uh, green or uh, bluish color is the lifetime, short lifetime, less than 10 hours. And this, uh, each plot is the lifetime versus radial distance, increasing this direction in night sight and also pitch angle. Left is for 100 keV proton, right is for 300 keV oxygen. You see for 100 keV proton, the lifetime can be small, less than 10 hours at L regions outside uh, L to five. But then for heavier ions, the lifetime can be shorter, can be less than 10 hours at closer to us at L uh, less than four. So that's what I said, is more significant for high energy particles. So that's for ring current, FLC scattering can be significant leading to pitch angle scattering. FLC can also lead, in, lead to pitch angle scattering of radiation bell particles that include uh, the greater than 10 MeV protons in the inner radiation belt and the MeV electrons in the outer belt. So you, if you're interested, you can feel free to read those papers. So that is the first type of anomalous magnetic field geometry leading to pitch angle scattering. The second type is also interesting. It's called drift orbit bifurcation, DOB. It occurs when the dayside magnetosphere is compressed by the solar wind, then you see this two local B minima on either side of the equator, and the particle will be locally trapped there. Uh, to explain a little more, I know this process may be a little bit involved. That I use the diagram modified from Yukoski 2011 paper. So this is midnight, dawn, noon, because the electrons shift from midnight to dawn, then to noon. Each plot shows the profile of B strands over the field line, S is the length, the center is the equator. So usually the field line, the B profile will be a U-shaped, right, with a minimum B on the equator. 
But when it's compressed on the day side, you will start to see a local maximum on the equator, and that local maximum keep increasing when you move into closer to noon. So when you have the U shape, the particle just bounce between two mirror points across hemispheres. But when the, uh, you have a local B maximum, and when the B maximum increases up to the B mirror, which is the mirror point in the magnetic field of the particle, the particle will be trapped on one side of the hemisphere and then bounce over here. So this is called DOB, shift OB bifurcation. It's also shown in this figure from my student, Jin Bei Huang. He presented this at JAM last week. And you can see different types of chief shells. Uh, this is open one, closed, and then you also see the shift OB bifurcation. Where, where the day, on the day side, the chief shell get bifurcated to one side of the equator. So DOB is more significant for higher pitch angle particles. Why? Well, we can think about if you have lower pitch angle particles, lower pitch angle particle would have higher BM. So when your BM is high, like up here, the local B maximum caused by compression wouldn't have any effect on the particle. Particle won't be trapped locally. And also DOB is more significant at larger L because the field is more compressed there. Uh, the detailed simulation by my student, Jim Bei, shows that DOB can actually penetrate inside the geosynchronous orbit at Kp greater or equal to three. And this is a figure from his simulation. In this, uh, this shows the shift orbit of particles on the equator at Kp equal to six. And we, he launched particles from different radial distance on the night side. And we see different, uh, types of shift shells. The black one again is the, like here, is the trapped particle with adiabatic drift. The green one like this is the uh, particles with open shift shell where they're lost to the magnetopause. The blue one in the middle is the DOB shift shells. And then you can see the DOB region can be all inside L equal to 6.6, .6, the geosynchronous orbit at Kp equal to six. So DOB can be significant for the transport of particles in the um, radiation belt region even. And, oh, this I didn't mention. DOB, because of the scale of the mechanism, it only violates the second and third environment, not the first environment. But it's, sufficient, it's efficient enough to lead to fast radio transport of particles due to the you know, variation of third environment and lead to efficient pitch angle scattering of particles by violating the second environment. So that is the uh, DOB pitch angle scattering. And so far, I've, I've been focusing on the first process to lead to precipitation is by pitch angle scattering. As I mentioned, precipitation can also be caused by enlarged lost cone. This is first proposed by Brito et al. in their papers. Here, they, they first report a observation. They find oscillations in the relativistic electron precipitation observed by balloon measurements, as shown here, is the barrel measurements. This is, uh, the color is the uh, precipitation electron flux, product versus time and energy. And the black curve on top is the integrated electron flux over the energies. And you find these oscillations of the flux, and they found the oscillation has a frequency in the range of ones to tens millihertz, uh, which is consistent with the frequency of ultra-low frequency waves, UF wave. So the mechanism they propose for this precipitation is UF wave would drive inward transport of electrons. And then when the loss cone, I play the movie here, when the, when the particles <clears throat> get through smaller L, the loss cone will become bigger then that will lead to more precipitation. So the interesting about this mechanism is it uh, doesn't violate any of the first or second environments. It only violates the third environment by UF waves. So interesting mechanism, but just a little bit more on the limitation of this mechanism. This mechanism on itself wouldn't be able to lead continuous precipitation because it still needs some mechanism to pump particles into the loss cone. Otherwise, you won't get continuous observation of the precipitation. <clears throat> but it can very well co uh, cooperate with the other loss mechanism like the wave scattering 
to act as a modulator will, will modulate the precipitation. See this nice uh, modulation here. So I hope you enjoy this uh, discussions of the mechanisms which drives precipitation. And here are all, I finished the background session. Now I will continue, move on, to talk about the recent advances in characterizing precipitation. And I will start from the uh, observational uh, efforts. So first, I will try to review the different types of precipitation observations. Um, for that, I guess it's good to start with a question. Do you think we could measure the precipitation at high altitude like here? Think about it and then I'll tell you the answer is it will be very difficult because the bounce loss cone is very small at high altitude. It can be less than six degree in the outer belt region on the equator. So that makes it very difficult to try to resolve the particles near or inside the loss cone at high altitude. But luckily, the bounce loss cone opens up at low altitude, making the low altitude ideal place to measure precipitation. So the first type of precipitation measurements is from LEO satellite, like SAMPEX, NOAA POSE, and a few very successful CubeSat missions like uh, CISWI, Firebird, uh, Aero Cubes, and so on. LEO satellite can directly measure the particle flux near or inside the loss cone. So that's the first type. The second type of measurements is at lower altitude by balloons, like the Barrow mission, where it measures the Bremsstrahlen X rays generated by precipitation of energetic electrons when they collide with the Earth's atmosphere. And by uh, measuring those X-rays, they can quantitatively derive the precipitating electron flux, as like in the figure I showed in the previous slide. So that's the balloon measurements. We also have a few measurements on the ground, including the all-sky imagers, which can record the aurora intensity. Also, we have rheometers and radars. Those two actually directly measure the electron density. Or, so by measuring or detecting the enhancement of electron density in the ionosphere, they can infer the energetic particle precipitation because, of, because the enhancement is due to precipitation of energetic particles. So these two are also helpful to infer the occurrence and maybe using some uh, very advanced inverse technique to infer the particle precipitation of uh, uh, flux. So those are the different types of precipitation observations. These two are more direct, these three are less direct. So here I will try to only focus on these two, the LEO measurements and the balloon measurements to show a few examples of the observation study for precipitation. So the first study I want to discuss here is from Blanc et al, 2015, where they are using the LEO satellite, the SAMPEX satellite, to survey the detailed features of precipitation. As you can see here, based on the high resolution, the 100 millisecond resolution flux from SAMPEX, they show that there are two distinct types of precipitation. The first is called microburst because it has rapid burst of precipitation for relativity electrons. That's why it's called microburst. And this is a seven minute and this 100 millisecond flux, very high resolution. And the second type is called band precipitation, like you can see here. That is a longer duration compared to microburst in, in this shape. So find the very two, interesting two types of precipitation. Further, they use the long-term observation from SAMPEX. They get the LMLT maps for these two types of precipitation. And you can use that to look at the occurrence of the microburst and band precipitation, and also the amplitude, which is showing the color of the precipitation. We find the microburst is most frequently observed on the downside, and that is where the chorus waves are strongest. This suggests maybe chorus is the driver for microburst. And, but for band precipitation, they found that it is most intense on the dusk side where EMIC waves are observed mostly. 
So maybe EMIC wave is the driver for the band precipitation. So very interesting results. And also, both of these two types are rapid precipitations, which large amplitude, potential large amplitude can be like order, order of magnitude in amplitude. So those two types of precipitation are able to produce substantial radiation bell electron losses. So this is the first study using LEO data. The second study I want to uh, briefly mention here is the Bremen 2015 paper. They used the balloon measurement, the barrel measurements to look at precipitation. Here they perform detailed analysis on the three hour, this is three hour conjunction between violent probes on the equator and the balloon measurements at low altitude for the precipitation. And in this figure, the black is the heat amplitude measured by violent probes. The, the red is the balloon X-ray count for the precipitation. You can see they're very well correlated, which they call coherence, great coherence between the heat wave and the precipitation. So this suggests that the energetic electron precipitation is potentially driven by heat waves. And also what's interesting here is they find this coherence, the scale of the coherence is pretty large. It's about six hours in MLT and 3.5 RE in L. Very significant. The size is even comparable to the size of the plasma sphere. So very interesting study using the balloon measurements. Uh, so I reviewed one study using LEO, one study using balloon. So what if we combine them together? What can we get? With that, we can get the scale of precipitation. So this is another example from Balloon paper, 2013 paper, where they uh, analyzed the conjunctive measurements of precipitation between the CubeSat mission, which is a CISWI mission from Colorado, and the barrel uh, measurements. Both of them measure precipitation. So the top two plots are the two precipitation bands observed by CISWI. This is band A, uh, which is observed about 23 UT, and band B observed about uh, one half hour later in the next day. And this is the barrel X-ray measurements versus time and energy, where you can see about three precipitation events. So the question is, which one of them is linked to band A, which one is linked to band B? That's the conjunction we try to find. Well, if we just look at the time, you would think this one is before the zero hour, so that's probably A, and this one is after zero hour is B. Is that right? Actually, when we think about conjunction, you need to think about precipitation is along the field line, so you want to try to find spatial conjunction. So here, they plot the orbits of CISWI in this spider shape and the barrel in the circle, the orbit of them in the LMHT uh, coordinates. And the color is the time. So the time goes from blue to red. So the balloon travels like and blue to red and CSV. So um, by looking at this, we can find the spatial conjunctions, right? So the empty circle is the precipitation band observed by CSV. So this is band A, this is band B. Um, and this solid dots are the precipitation observed by barrel. By looking at this, we find actually band A is spatially conjuncted with the balloon precipitation at a later time because time goes like this way. And band B is actually corresponding to or spatially conjuncted with the balloon measurements at an earlier time. So this need to be reversed because A is the later one for balloon and B is the earlier one for balloon. So this shows it's very important to be very careful to find the conjunctions and to link the precipitations. Um, and also in this paper, they use this multiple satellite to estimate the spatial scale and time duration of the precipitation and to quantify their effect to the particle loss. And that cannot be done with a single point measurements. So that's the observation advances, which I will re I'd review here. And I will continue to review the advance in modeling 
for precipitation. Also, I start with some review of the different types. There are mainly three types of model for precipitation. One is the empirical model, second is the MHD parameterization, and the third is kinetic model. Empirical model example is the ovation prime model, where they use the solar wind parameters, like the flow speed, MFB, the clock angle as input, to specify the aurora energy flux and the aurora number flux. Uh, but the, this model has its pros and cons. The pros of this model is it's easy to use, and you can get spe a global speculation of the precipitation, as shown here. And also, it can be useful for forecast because it's based on solar wind parameters. But the limitation is this empirical model, so the small scale and the fast variations will be smoothed out in the average. So that's the first type, empirical model. The second type of precipitation model is based on MHD parameters, like in this paper, Zhang et al. 2015, where they used MHD parameters like the temperature and density for electron, the field line current and magnetic field, and to drive the model to get the precipitation energy flux and the total energy of precipitation. Uh, this model, the good thing is, is self-contained in MHD code. Once you run the MHD, you get everything. It also get, you ha can have global speci specification of the precipitation. But the limitation is this model is only approximate because as we discussed, the mechanism for precipitation is mainly kinetic, right? It's kinetic mechanism. So they may not be able to well represent it by MHD parameters. So to get physics-based models, we have the kinetic, kinetic model. Kinetic model, there are two types as well, diffusion type, as particle. For diffusion, like the RAM SCB model, the input, of course, you need the diffusion coefficients. And also you need to have global electromagnetic field to specify the background field. And uh, uh, this model can also specify the global um, precipitation. Um, Pros and cons. First, it's physics-based, it's kinetic model, includes kinetic physics, and it's generally efficient for global modeling. The limitation is, it's based on the assumption of quadrilinear theory and the diffusion, which may not be valid in some applications. And then we have the test particle code. While the input for test particle, we basically chase tons of test particles in global electromagnetic models or analytical wave models, to check the evolution of particle flux, then you can get the precipitation. Also has its own pros and cons. The good thing is it doesn't rely on the diffusion assumption, so it can include nonlinear processes. But the limitation is very often it can be computationally expensive, so it's difficult to specify the global precipitation. So that's the different types of models. And here I will focus on the kinetic models and uh, show a few examples from the literature, from the community on the development of those models. First diffusion type, uh, the simplest diffusion model for precipitation is the 1D pitch angle diffusion model. Based on the equation shown here, at given L and energy, and this term is the diffusion, pitch angle diffusion term, and you have some additional loss inside the loss cone. For well, the diffusion coefficients is usually derived using the quadrilinear theory based on the wave data. And this model can be used to simulate local precipitation. It's a, here I show an example from the Lee et al. 2014 paper, where they find a nice conjunction between the EMIC waves observed by Gauss at, at, on the equator and the precipitation at low altitude measured by Barrow. So they want to see, using the 1D pitch angle diffusion model, how much of this precipitation can be reproduced. So they use the observed waves and plasma parameters to calculate the diffusion coefficient and run the simulation. And here is their model results. And here's the observation. Basically, I zoom in, they zoom in this precipitation band and show the detailed precipitation here, flux versus time and energy. This is observation, this is model you can see the model fairly well captures the uh, precipitation flux and variations. So this is one deep angle diffusion where you can get or simulate local precipitation. 
But if you want to get the global simulation across different longitude, we would need a 2D shift diffusion model as shown here. And this is the extra term, the drift for particles. Why is the drift important? Let's start from this picture. We know the Earth's dipole is off-center in reality. So that will lead to different size of loss cone at different longitude, narrower here, wider here. Here, I actually calculate the loss cone in equatorial pitch angle and plot it versus longitude. This is at L equal to four. You can see the loss cone show a strong dependence on longitude, which is widest here in this longitude range, which is actually the South Atlantic anomaly region. So how would this longitude dependent loss cone affect the low altitude electron distribution? Well, let's think about the physics. Pitch angle diffusion act in this direction, bring particles from high pitch angle to low pitch angle and eventually lost to the loss cone. Meanwhile, you have the drift of particles from left to right. So if the pitch angle diffusion, here I'm talking about the electrons, so the drift is eastward, by the way. So if the pitch angle diffusion is dominant over the drift, meaning the diffusion is much faster than the drift, the particles will just be bringing into the loss cone and the precipitation will happen everywhere. So the precipitation would be evenly distributed over longitude and you will get something like this. This is the simulated precipitation electron flux from the model versus longitude and a different color for different energies. You can see for fast diffusion case, it is relatively flat over longitude. But on the other hand, if the diffusion is slow compared to the drift, so it will slowly bring particle in as the particle drift, then you would see an increase of particle flux over longitude as it carried by the drift. So as this is color shows the simulation results in this domain, you can see it in the drift loss cone is increasing in longitude and the precipitation is mostly happen near the South Atlantic anomaly region. And here again shows this line plot. This is the precipitating flux inside the loss cone. You can see it shows a strong longitude dependence and most of the precipitation occurs near the South Atlantic anomaly region. So this tells us the low altitude electron distribution is a delicate balance between drift and pitch angle diffusion. That's why we need this type of model. And the difference, uh, also something different in these two works, we didn't pre-compute the D alpha alpha, the diffusion coefficient to feed into the model. Rather, we make a free parameter and try to feed the data to determine the, to infer the diffusion coefficient. And that detail I'm not showing here. So this type of model we can use to get the global precipitation as shown here. But Still, this model is at given L and energy. If we want to explicitly include the particle transport across L and energy in the model, we need to turn to the 4D advection diffusion model with this long equation having extra terms across L and energy. And the pitch angle scattering by waves is included as one of the loss mechanisms in diffusion equation. So, here I show the example from the REM SCB model from Jordan Nova 2008 paper. And here you see the precipitation maps. So the new thing in this paper is they self consistently include the excitation of EMIC waves in the model and use that to drive the precipitation. You can see uh, during different phases of the storm, EMIC drives MEV electron precipitation and also Hendrix KV proton precipitation. So, very useful model to get global precipitation. Now we have seen the beautiful power of diffusion type models. You may wonder, are they perfect? Is that all we need? For that question, let's look at the Moser paper, 2018 JGR paper. Well, they find a remarkable coherence between the precipitating electron flux observed by error cube satellite and the uh, chorus wave amplitude of the bivalent probe at, on the equator. And this is the wave, uh, this is the precipitation, this is the wave. You can see they have a very good coherence. So they want to see the limit of diffusion 
So they used the observed wave to, do, to perform some estimate using the quadlinear theory to try to estimate the precipitation and compare with the observation. And here is what they get. Now the black curve is the observation, but one second averaged. This is 0.1 second averaged. So you don't see these bursty features here. And the, the colored lines are from the quadlinear theory, different colors because they're using different plasma density parameters. So you see this little bit uncertainty there. But we see generally the bulk part of the precipitation is captured by quadrilinear theory. However, the bursty features from the high resolution data, which um, po potentially caused by this large amplitude chorus waves are not captured. For that we need, that can be due to nonlinear wave part interaction and we need test particle simulation. So this is an example of the test particle simulation for microburst by Saito 2012 paper, where they simulate the interaction between MeV electrons and the rising band cores using a 3D test particle code, very powerful code. And their results nicely show that the microburst can be reproduced or produced by interacting with rising tone element of the chorus at high latitude. So very interesting results. So now I have reviewed the observation advances, modeling advances. I will try to finish up with discussing some unsolved questions and future opportunities. The first unsolved question I think is the relative contribution of precipitation to the loss as I mentioned before. I will start with a figure from Hong et al. 2009 paper, where they show the, again, LMLT map of the greater than one MeV trapped electrons observed by NOAA pole satellites. So this maps a statistical average from years of pulse data. And this is at different phases of the storm when they do the averaging. This is pre-storm, this is main phase, this is recovery phase. For the trapped electron flux, we see the flux decrease during the main phase and increase in the recovery phase. So on the right hand side, they show similar maps for precipitating electrons. But before we show that, let's think about it. If we have this trapped and this variation, what would you expect the precipitating map, precipitation map be like? Well, intuitively, if we assume the loss during the main phase is due to precipitation, you should see enhanced precipitation during the main phase. But is that what the observation shows? No. Observation shows enhanced precipitation actually in the recovery phase. So this is very interesting. Say, so let's think about is the precipitation loss really, really correlated? If so, why do we see loss with no precipitation and precipitation? with no loss. Or specifically, if the main phase loss is not due to precipitation, what's the driving mechanism? And in the recovery phase, what's the reason for the enhanced precipitation? Is it because the driver or the waves are stronger during the recovery phase, or simply because there are more trapped particles to be precip precipitated from? So to answer these detailed questions and to resolve, the relative contribution of precipitation to energetic particle loss, I think we need models that link high altitude loss observed at high altitude for the trapped particle, link that with the low altitude precipitation. And for the models, we need realistic model inputs, including the waves and plasma field. Specifically, especially, we need the global observation of the waves to drive the model. So that's the first challenge I see. The second challenge is the, global quanti the quantification of the global precipitation. I've discussed that we have made grow great progress in both the modeling and data uh, uh, efforts for the precipitation. But significant efforts are still needed to combine them to reach global precipitation. On the model side, we see quadrilinear theory is quite powerful in getting the precipitation but better model, better inputs are still needed. Also, I mentioned there's nonlinear physics which cannot, which are not included in quadrilinear theory. How important are they? It's, important, it's a critical question. So 
For that, let's look back, look again at the Moser paper. As we see, well, the quadrilinear theory, even though it didn't capture the bursty feature in the high resolution data, it captures the one second averaged flux. So is that already good enough for global precipitation? Do we still need the nonlinear effects? So I think to fully understand or answer that question, we need to keep looking into uh, studying the limit of quadrilinear theory and studying the effect of the nonlinear effect. Uh, on the data side, I already mentioned we'll have a different variety types of data, including Leo, balloon, rheometer. But how do we smartly combine them together? How do we properly combine them together? Because each data has its own limitation and also uncertainties. That's a very challenging task. And also, on the other hand, even though we have a lot of data already, we still need more data with better temporal resolution to see the fast variations and also better energy resolution. And I'm glad to see we, already, we, also, we already have a few upcoming missions uh, going towards that direction. And finally, how to combine model and data smartly so that we can count on some techniques like data simulation and machine learning to include, to combine the model with its own limitation and data, all of the data together. So that's a, another challenge I'm seeing. And finally, after we have high fidelity quantification of the precipitation, the next challenge is how do we self-consistently couple that into the global modeling of MI coupling? Great initiative has already been taken in the community in the coupling model, coupled model. Examples shown here for the space weather modeling framework from Dan Welling's paper. Well, they coupled the RAM SCB model, which is the kinetic model, with the global MHD model, Betteras. And electron precipitation is an important component of the coupling. And they have already done uh, very good studies and show the electron precipitation can be very important for the ion sphere electrodynamics. Example is shown here from Yi Chun Yu's paper 2016. The top is the model results for physics-based precipitation from REM SCB, and the bottom are from the MHD parameterization of precipitation. This, the left column are the precipitating electron flux, the right are the whole conductance in the ion sphere. You can see the precipitation level is very different from the physics-based coupling and MHD parameterization. And as a result, the conductance also show very different intensity and pattern. So it is very exciting to see the precipitation make a big impact on the ion sphere dynamics. But so that will make us happy. So the ion sphere would care about the magnetosphere people. But the question is, do we need to care about the ion sphere people? Or in other words, um, What's the significance of the feedback effects from the coupling on the magnetosphere dynamics? I think that's not, still not very well understood and more work need to be done here. So that's my a few remarks on the challenges and unsolved questions. And there's definitely a, few, a lot more and I, I'm looking forward to discussions with people. And this is the summary. Uh, we know precipitation of energetic particles plays an important role in Magnetosphere dynamics, MI coupling, and atmospheric chemistry is driven by various mechanisms that either scatter the particle into the lost cone or enhance the lost cone. Great observations and modeling uh, efforts have been uh, made in quantitatively characterizing precipitation. However, our work is not done. There are still challenges in understanding and quantifying global precipitation and self-consistent modeling of ML coupling. And that's all for today. I hope you enjoy the presentation in my talk and thank you. Thank you, Isha. That was a great talk, uh, very well presented. And we have a lot of questions, more wow. than usual, I think, and comments <laughs> as well. <laughs> so let's get started with the first question. This is a more general question from Krishna Chandra and he wants to know more about magnetical shadowing. Oh, want to know more, sure. That's my, one well, of my favorite too. So let's go to this slide. Yeah, magnetopause shadowing. So usually that's driven by the compression of the magnetopause by the solar wind. Also, it's related to the outward drift, uh, outward radio transport of electrons. These two combines 
would bring the particles lost to the magneto cause. And also due to the shadowing, you will create a sharp gradient in the base density versus L profile, and that would further enhance the outward radio diffusion in the mechanism. And that's one of the important loss mechanisms for radiation bell particles and also for ring current particles. Okay. So uh, the next question is from Marisa Hedlund. Um, and she's asking if um, you think the particles get trapped due to IARs or similar magnetospheric resonant properties. Uh, say again, my, I get trapped in high L? D due to IARs. I don't know if that, that's a I, reference. It's a uh, ionospheric resonators. It's due oh. to magnetic deposition. Okay, that I am. I don't know a lot about. Sorry. No, so, no, no. Okay, I, yeah. I would think I, I think I just was drawing a connection from like inner mag to ionosphere. Very good. I should. I think I should learn more about that the resonance. But whenever you have resonance, there's way part. If there's particle interaction with the field, you may get some local trapping of the particle, also local scattering. So yeah, I'm interested in that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marisa. Thank you, Richard. So next question is from Drew Turner. Mm -hmm. And DOB can also result in wave growth of chorus and M equates in those of equatorial B minima. Can you please comment more on how interactions with those waves at higher latitudes might further affect outer belt electron precipitation? Yes. That's a very good comment. Let me move to the slide. DOB, because of the field geometry, it can further enhance the anisotropy of the field, which will further will help excitation of the EMIC waves and some of the chorus waves. So those waves, because they also play an important role in the scattering of particles and acceleration of particles, so that would definitely further complicate the picture here. And in the simulation by my student, uh, we are only focusing on the uh, magnetic field effect to isolate only the DOB effect directly on the particle. But that's definitely, if we want to get a very comprehensive modeling, those effects on the waves and on the particles will also need to be included. Yeah, but that's very good comments. Yes, thank you, Drew. Okay, so another question from Krishna Chandra. Uh, is the DOB occurrence related to any particular solar wind condition? Uh, I think you just need this local bump. So if you have a press, I think the pressure will be most efficient in this way. But definitely, if you have complicated uh, solar wind condition, which make the uh, the asymmetry between the southern hem and the northern hemisphere, that would make this uh, picture even more interesting. So yeah, but I think here the main thing is the compression. Okay, thank you. So the next question is from Boris Petrovich. Are there any simulations with data of lost corn precipitation and data on the ULF waves? Uh, what's the first on data and simulation on what first one? Any any simulation with data of lost corn precipitation? A loss of precipitation. Yeah, I mean, the data I showed, the, the, all the types I showed, they are mainly measuring the particle precipitation inside the lost cones. So the, all of this, uh, but especially the balloon one can measure loss cone and the LEO satellite can also directly measure the loss cone. So actually the data I showed, they are, they are all the particles inside the loss cone. Simulation, yes. All of the types I mentioned, they have the capability to directly simulate the lost cone particles. And for the waves also, if you have the magnetometer and then UF waves is the easiest to measure compared to other waves. So there are a lot of a very high quality UF wave measurements. Yes, yes and yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. So another question, well, the first question from Patri. Uh, for ring current protons, is precipitation bigger than charge exchange loss? Yeah, charge exchange also is a very important. I didn't mention that. I, you know, um, yeah, it's a good point. Charge exchange is a very important uh, loss mechanism for ring current particles as well. And uh, that uh, is, I think that's more efficient for lower energy even. 
it has faster loss for low energy than high energy. The uh, FLC I showed from my postdoc work, that interesting part is that can lead to the loss, efficient loss for hundreds of keV protons in the ring current. Yeah, but you raise a very good point. I think overall this talk may be a little biased towards radiation belt. So I um, apologize for that, but there's definitely a lot of other mechanisms I may not have the space to include here. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Question from Zheng. Uh, how do you define 3D adiabatic invariance for drift shell uh, by friction particles? Oh, very good. Very good question. When the particle, let me, I think the DOB is very interesting here. When the particle get bifurcated, theoretically speaking, the third invariant is violated, so there's no L star. And if you want to know all the more details, uh, for DOB, sometimes the effect is diffusive, sometimes the effect is more advective, means the change can be small or big. If the change in the, let's say, the particles, they start here. If the change transport in L is small, then most of them will come back to about the same location. Then you can you still try to approximate that as trapped or not trapped, approximate that as a, a fifth shell. But like in this case, the, the one I show here, this is for 90 degree particle, where the DOB effect is more significant, you have the jump in L, you can see the particle starts here, this is the first one, and then it, it, it come back here. And the second uh, line, the second blue line come back here. So the L shows a big jump. In that case, making the L calculation sometime, some, uh, somewhat questionable. So we need to be thinking about what do we mean? So for sure, the L star is not conserved anymore. There should be no L star. But do you need, you, we may still need a parameter to quantify the transport. So what quantity are you calculating? How do you calculate it? That's a very important question. And this is a very good question. Thank you. More questions? Oh, man, are you there? Oh, I am here. Sorry, I was muted. I was talking to muted. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's let's go through some comments. Um, uh, we had some really good comments here. Very good. So the first one is from Marisa, and when you were talking about electron precipitation, I think she commented that she's looking at a similar radial study of O2 O plus observationally with MMS and RBSP, uh, and I think. She says anybody interested can contact her. The okay. email was posted in the chat. Uh, we yeah. have. You have any comments on that, or should I go to the next comment? No, just very nice. Yeah, very good to know. Thank very you. Nice. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, so the next comment from Dong Lin, um, and the most recent progress in CGS modeling has started incorporating kinetic physics in characterizing precipitation. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Any very comments good. on that, or should I go to the next one? Yeah, just keep reading. Very nice. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm glad. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and then the last comment I have here is uh, from Zheng. Uh, just wanted to point out that the Newell's et al. Uh, ovation model is mainly for particles in the auroral energy range, not so much for radiation, but electrons. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. The energy range is is very important to be able to uh, to uh, be very clear about. Energetic particles means very different energy range for different people. Very good. Thank you for the comment. Yeah. Uh, and we have here some last minute comments coming in. Please discuss the need for understanding the phase angle as the individual particles go through drift orbit by fraction. The phase angle of individual particles as the individual mm -hmm. in the precipitation, or like a, let me see, are you talking about the the drift diffusion model ish? I'm trying to understand this, the question. This is from Jerry. Jerry uh, 
um, really discuss the, the nature of how you need to understand the phase angle as you are predicting the L star values as it comes out of the drift orbit bifurcation. Oh, the bifurcation? Yes. Yeah, that again, the L star for the bifurcation is a tricky point because it's not, there's no L star. So theoretically speaking, you cannot calculate L star. But then depends on what you mean. If you want to get a L parameter, you can try to integrate. So, so the particle will still you know, start here and then drift and then come back in whatever radial distance after the DOB. So in that case, you, you still want to have a whole drift. If the part, if the, so the, the drift, so I think the drift uh, phase will be, still be averaged out. So you still need to get a whole drift for if you want to calculate the L parameter. And then you may be, one method I'm, I'm thinking, we haven't done it yet. We can map the, the field line from the, 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 we can just map the drift shell to the surface of the earth and then calculate the oval, the magnetic flux through there. And you still use the L star, equation, which is related to the magnetic flux through the drift shell, we calculate a pseudo, I call pseudo L star. We can still do it, but uh, it's not the real L star. It's just one index, one parameter to infer the transport. So I'm not sure if that answers your drift phase question, because I think the drift phase will be all integrated in that. Well, and it, it's not specific the drift phase that I'm talking about. It's the phase angle with respect to the part individual particle motion because you have a pitch angle and a phase angle and the phase angle with respect to some particular reference frame and that phase angle I would argue that that phase angle is going to determine which of the blue paths it's going to enter oh. and so statistically you're not going to see that wash out you're actually going to see the phase angle be a determinant as to how the particles uh, exit the drift orbit bifurcation area. I see your point. You're talking about uh, like uh, when when the BM when the local maximum match the BM, the phase angle at which they met they enter that region would have a effect on the transport. That is right. 100. That is very very true. We we see that the phase angle make a big difference. And there's actually a theoretical study try to uh, derive that dependence. And in the simulation, this is only show one particle. In our simulation, we try to include particle in different bound space and then try to see the average effect and also the dependence. So yeah, very good. Now I got your question. Yes, very good. Yeah, this is all very, very true. Okay, thank you. So just the last question and it comes from Delarus and uh, I think wants to unmute and ask the question. Sure. Wei Chao, very nice presentation. I'm curious about something that you mentioned uh, related to Bremster lung and X-ray and the amount of, you know, kind of following the path of that energy uh, down into the atmosphere. Do you think that that is a, 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 an area that needs some further um, research related to what is actually happening uh, to those photons uh, and how they're interacting with the atmosphere? Right, I, I, I agree. For me, um, uh, I'm not the best person to answer that because I'm like, I'm one of the users for the data. I didn't, so when they get the x-ray, they try to in, uh, inverse, infer back the uh, MEV electron precipitation. And in that process, they must make some assumptions on what's going on there, but I'm not super familiar with that. I think uh, Robin Millen for the Barrel mission, they, she must have a better answer uh, than me. Uh, but I think that process is very important. And okay. yeah, for the, uh, to how to properly invert the flux and then how would that affect the atmosphere? Did that right, answer thanks. the question? Sorry, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Wei Xiao. Thank you for answering all the questions. A great presentation and attracted a lot of questions and comments, definitely. <laughs> um, and before everybody goes, I would like to thank everyone for their questions and comments. And I want to remind you all to join us again next week at the same time. Uh, Claire Watt will discuss aerial acceleration mechanisms and how they are 
related to the magnetospheric substance. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining. And once again, thank you so much, Rachel. It was a great talk. Thank you. Thank you, Hermione. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.